Let me show you another toy that I think about for fine motor development and then another interest and that would be magnets. The kids really start to love uh, to play with toys with magnets because it's so cool to them to kind of learn about that and that this is stuck on and can I get can I get the magnet to stick on this toy and why won't it stick on that toy? So it's a great kind of problem solving toy for kids too. But I like it for fine motor development. And I've got this great little uh, magnet set. I think this is, is Melissa and Doug, but you'll have to see below. I'll include the right uh, product in the link below. But look for a, to a toy with magnets because that's a great one. I have a little woodpecker toy. And again, I'll try to link that. I don't have it here with me today. But great, great way to help kids begin to work on that next little level of I find motor skills, but we're also helping them learn about a, a new concept there too. So great, great with problem solving. Now here, language wise, let's talk about some of the language things that you can work on. And remember we said here that we're working on pronoun development, we're working on ing verbs, and even plurals. And we can work on all of those just with this uh, little toy set. And so you might, you know, as you're playing model, you know, at the beginning of this stage you might still be modeling a lot of two word phrases so i hook or three word phrases i hook car but then by the end and you know the middle and the end you need to model something a little bit more um in keeping with our milestones here so i'm hooking the car or even if they're leaving off that uh, contracted copula i hope i'm saying that correctly you're remembering that correctly using those uh different little verb contraction or contractions there with uh, the subject plus the verb with I'm, uh, model that for them and, and see what you can do again with working on that verb with, or that structure with just some exposure there. And so even, you know, again, those two word phrases at the beginning, I hook, hook car, you know, take off, pull off, those kinds of things. And then by the end, you know, again, you're signing uh, the things that are a little bit more complex. You know, I'm hooking the car, I'm taking the car off, I'm pulling the car off, I'm pushing the truck. And, and work on your specific little language goals within the context of that play activity. Now, therapists are used to that. We're used to kind of taking whatever our goal is and matching it with whatever the activity happens to be. But sometimes parents need a little bit more help with that. And for you to really really spell out what exactly they're supposed to be working on and so be sure that you're doing that with a lot of modeling but with lots and lots of specific directions this handout for the show has some great uh, little scripts and all the examples that I've been giving are listed on the handout so that might be another reason for you to want to get the handout so that you can share that uh, with parents of children that you're seeing or also as a parent with your child's team so that you can talk about what you're working on with language at home and make sure that's on the same page as your speech language pathologist or even your other therapist on your team. So great toy to do that with. Check those magnet toys out. Let's start with this toy microwave. Now I have used this toy for a long, long time and it's one of my absolute favorites. It is popular with little friends from the time they're toddlers all the way through preschool. So this is a good investment for you to make. You'll get a lot of bang for your buck. So what are we working on here at stage six? We are helping children expand play. So we want them doing lots of steps. So with the toy microwave, you are naturally going to need something for them to cook. And so I like the little plastic foods for this. And I love when a kid gets over two to use the cuttable foods. Now, under two, a child may be able to do this with some help, with you doing some hand over hand, cutting the foods. But after two, they should certainly be able to do it on their own. And so you've added another step here. And you are talking about the food. You know, you may even have them request what they want to cook. If you're keeping all of the foods, you know, in the Ziploc bags that I show you all the time or a basket or something, you know, you might uh, be the keeper of the food. And so the child has to ask you for what they want next if they are at that requesting level. And again, if they're not saying sentences, have them do it in a phrase or, you know, longer phrases like we've been talking about toward this uh, this or in this developmental period toward the end, have them do it in a phrase. If the kid that you're working with, his play skills are here, but his language skills aren't, he can certainly request using a single word. If you have our little friends who are nonverbal, they can request with a sign or with a gesture like pointing. And so again, you can use this toy for children who are 
in this developmental stage play-wise, but not necessarily language-wise. So I hope that I'm giving you some ideas for kind of all of these, even if uh, all of these kinds of kids, even if they're not all at the same level with play and language. But remember here what we said, our focus here for play is combining more steps. So we have them pick the food, cut the food, and then cook the food. Now I love this toy and it just malfunctioned when I was trying to do an earlier take, so I hope it'll work for me this time. But you, uh, you can see the microwave really operates. So you put the food in, you push the button, and then it turns. It is a ton of fun for toddlers. The carrot's too big, let's just do half. It's a ton of fun for toddlers because they can watch it go. You may develop some verbal routines for this. I really like, uh, you know, wait, 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 or it's turning, it's turning, or spin, 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 or around, around, around. Give them a word and give them, again, new vocabulary to use throughout this routine. And then you might say something like, it's ready, you know, what do we have to do? And so again, do some gentle withholding so that you are waiting for them to tell you the next step and you're really encouraging that language. So you know, you can playfully obstruct the, the door and not let that child open the door until, you know, you say, what do we do next? What do we have to do? And so, you know, he tells you open or open the door, or whatever language level. And then, you know, we take the food out and then we can keep that sequencing going with him pretending he's going to eat the food himself. He can plate it. You know, you can, you can, uh, he can give you a bite. He can feed a doll there. But again, it's a great toy for helping a child think about what's the next step. What do we do next? That next thing. And really, really helping him, oh, excuse me, uh, expand those play routines. Uh, I like targeting phrases here too, which would be a developmentally appropriate for this stage. And I like to use anchor phrases. Now, we've talked about this in previous shows. You might call them I don't know, you might call them different things, but I call them anchor phrases, and I think about that it's just that I'm going to keep one word the same, or the anchor, and then I'm going to change the next word, and that's kind of what we're going to practice, and this is so effective, especially for our little guys with motor planning uh, difficulties, or even if they're not three yet, even if we've not officially diagnosed them with uh, childhood apraxia of speech, we know that they're working on that, and so it's easier for a child to change that second word or the first word as long as we have one part of that phrase staying the same so here you know you can start with if they're just at the two word phrase you know cook banana cook fish cook bread cook chicken if we bumped up to the level that we're really working on 24 to 30 months language wise you know I'm cooking banana I'm cooking orange I'm cooking fish and again we're really listening for that ing or that verb tense we can also you know teach early pronouns here so I'm cooking orange, you cook fish, and so again, we can work on various um, milestones here that we're targeting at this developmental level. This toy is great for our gestalt language learner. So what's a gestalt language learner? It's a kid who learns in chunks, and so not only do they start to speak in chunks when they start to talk and sound scripted or a little bit echolalic, they also process in chunks. And so it's a nice thing for us to remember to talk to parents about is that they're not analytical learners and are little kind of, we kind of think about that as typical where children learn what one word means at a time and then they build that complexity. Well, our little friends who are gestalt language learners learn in chunks. And so a phrase like, it's time to go to school, that's all one word to them. You know, they've heard it like that and that's how they're learning and identifying that whole process. And so even little holistic phrases like, I got it, I did it, where'd it go, what's that? Or even something more scripted like to infinity and beyond or something, you know, again, that's definitively from a movie or a book or a previous kind of conversation that they lifted and they have that little phrase and they like it. We need to maximize those learning opportunities for our little friends and use those phrases in therapy, especially when they're not as verbal as we would like them to be. That's a surefire way to get a gestalt language learner talking, is to pick up some of his, and again, if he's not quite talking yet, but really to pick up some of those things and, and expand his vocabulary with using some of those same uh, phrase targets that he uses and use some of those uh, same kinds of words. So here, usually uh, we think about good phrases to get to stop language learners talking would be let's plus something else, I'm or it's a, uh, and I like time too. And I think a lot of parents have had great success with using a phrase like time too throughout the day to signal transitions. And so 
You can even do it again, even in a single play thing where you're, you know, time to cook, time to open, time to shut, time to cut, time to blow, time to eat. And so again, a great way to introduce verbs when we've got that beginning part of the phrase there stays the same so that a child again learns that, uh, that additional word and has the safety or security of that phrase to help them get going. So great, great way to do that too. Um, again, we talked about the other variety of goals that we can work on with this. Um, sequencing action, so is our big thing. And, oh, let me say one more thing. You can also have kids who, if they're not quite at this developmental level yet, and they're, again, hanging out there at single words, use choices to really increase the frequency uh, that they use words within a single play routine. And so you might, you know, again, you know, which one are we going to cut first, the fish or the banana, you know, and they choose. And then, oh, um, what are you going to do? Or, you, you know, who's going to cut you or me? You know, and then they say me, and then they cut the fish. Okay, so we've done that. Now, what are we going to do? Are we going to eat or cook? Oh, okay, we're going to cook it. What do we have to do? Do we leave the door shut or do we open? And you just keep those choices going throughout that routine. And it's a very, very nice way to increase the number of words that a child uses, even if it's imitated. He'll get there <laughs> spontaneously, but we have to introduce it that way at first. And I know that I said, hey, here at this developmental level, let's hang back and not do so much direct cueing. I'm talking about after they've already got to say that consistent three-word level kind of over that hump of 27 to 30 months. Before then, with late talkers, you really might have to cue it because it might be the only way that you can get the word. So remember that. If they're still at single words, uh, choices are a great, great way to get those imitated words going. All right, let's keep our kitchen thing going and look at another fun toy. And here it is, a sink with running water. How about that? So this is such a big hit with toddlers. And like the microwave, this toy will be used for a long, long time with children. And I really like these smaller sets like the microwave and the sink. It lets a parent kind of put together a little kitchen set, sort of one piece at a time. And if parents, you know, certainly, and even therapists, if you have an in-center program and have a great big kitchen set, that's great. But this is fantastic for home visits or, again, for parents who don't have the resources or the room to get uh, a big kitchen set like that. These little pieces are just great, great options for kids. So um, think about teaching our play and language combinations. So what was our big play goal here? Remember, we want children to sequence their steps and we also want them to what? We want them to group and organize toys. So this is a fantastic toy for teaching that because you can teach separating dishes versus food, you know, uh, you know, early categories like that. You can even separate maybe bowls versus plates. And so really help a kid uh, get in uh, that practice with really grouping and matching things. Remember what we said about more steps. And so here certainly our biggest step is going to be what? Putting the a dish in the sink and then turning the water on and washing those dishes and kids will have so much fun with this and phrases our language goals are naturally built into this activity you know turn water on turn water off I'm I'm washing dishes I dry dishes I uh, you know whatever just tons and tons of ideas for this with working on not only our little picky goals that we're talking about with ing verbs and plurals and um, possessives, pronouns, all those other goals that we were talking about, but you can certainly even work on those combinations and even things again like new words that kids uh, may not be using yet. So fantastic toy for teaching all of those goals. Our next big theme is baby doll play and here we can combine our baby doll set that we talked about a lot back in the previous show. We talked about that you can buy these kinds of pre-made sets or you can take a little set. I bought this one at Dollar General. I think it was seven or eight bucks, but then I added some different things to it and certainly that's something that's a real practical way to help a parent see how to pull together little sets for their children to play with to help them learn to expand play routines. Now, like we said about the toy sink, uh, this little toy uh, bathtub is a real hit with toddlers and there is such a range of uh, what the tub will do and how hard it is to operate it. I've gotten these little sets at anywhere from Dollar General 
all the way to the fancier ones on Amazon. And so again, you really get what you pay for, but remember, uh, it's a great investment for a child because water play is going to be a big hit for a long time. Now this is a set that I got from Amazon and honestly, you can get it going and a kid can get it going, but it is going to take some effort. But I sort of like that because that builds in an opportunity for a child to ask you for help. And so here you can cue things like help me please or I need help or you know let's do water or turn water on or make water go or you know again a lot of possibilities for whatever your target phrase is going to be there. But super super toy and again kids are going to stay so motivated with this because they're going to want to see that water pump and so you're going to see them stay with this toy for a long long time. Another kind of a uh, quick trick for kids when you can't really get them involved is having them really squeeze the washcloth or squeeze the wipe and um, see that water come out. That's another way that if I see a kid kind of I'm losing him um, and I want him to come back to me, that's another little trick that I use with this. Now here we talk about, uh, you, you can use anything from single words, so for our kids who are at this stage of play but have a mismatch with their language skills, and we see that a lot with our kids who are just straight late talkers. They come in with all their other skills in place, they're great players, but their language isn't caught up, and so when we, when we have kids like that, we really need to think about, I'm going to match their play skills with a what the activities are that I'm going to choose, but I'm going to keep their language at what their language goal is. And again, that's kind of self-explanatory, but if you're a parent and kind of new the, to this speech therapy stuff, and you want your child to speak in sentences and longer phrases, of course, but they're not doing a lot of single words, you're going to need to stay at that single word level for a while and really help them uh, just learn lots and lots of different words and again master that before we have those expectations to move them on to maybe a level that they're not quite ready for yet. And so I like to tell parents, and I say this all the time on the show, but anytime a kid is having difficulty with something, it means what? It means that it's too hard. <laughs> and so you've got to back it up and make that skill a little simpler. So if you are cueing phrase after phrase after phrase and getting nowhere, or you know, say you're trying to get a three or four word phrase, back it up to a two word phrase. I still can't get that, back it up to that single word level and find that level where that child is going to be successful with you. Same thing with play. Here our goal is to sequence steps, but don't get so carried away that you were trying to have him do eight steps. When he's just turned two, you know, it's not going to happen. And so back it up to make it simpler. You know, we want to get two steps. Then we want get, to get a three-step play routine and then a four-step play routine. And again, one of your cues needs to be, what comes next? What should we do next? So that you're helping him think about that next step. So what are some things that we could do here with this kind of play with with the bathtub. And I want to break it down because I, I always get emails after a show that say something like, thank you for all the good ideas. I'm not very creative and I really need specifics to get me going. Or something like, uh, I need even more ideas. Can you explain that even more? And so let's talk about what we would do here for a, a bath time routine. What would be all the little steps? Well, of course, we our baby doll should probably start off dressed. So we take the clothes off and then we get ready to what? What's the next step? What would come next? We're going to put her in the tub and then what would come next? We're going to try to, you know, get the shower to work, you know, so turn water on. What else could we do in the bathtub? Well, we could wash different body parts. And you don't just say wash baby. We're going to break it down, you know. Wash toes, wash foot, wash knee, wash face, wash elbow, wash belly. And so again, a great way to kind of get those phrases going and whatever that next step is. And again, don't make it too complicated, especially with a child who is at the beginning of this stage or developmentally, you know, at the beginning of this stage. And that would be, you know, just really getting consistent uh, two-word combinations and then just two steps in play. And again, that would be a kid who's at the end of stage five, getting ready to go into stage six. My point here is don't overwhelm them with too many things at once. You know, just work on this gradually, adding kind of that next step. And let me say that two-year-olds, especially in the beginning, are super repetitive. So they may do the same three steps over and over and over again, and that's okay because we want them to develop that experience and again make it fun for them and motivating so they're going to want to keep going but lots of times kids need that repetition so that they can really learn it and really own those skills so don't freak out too much now if they're doing the same one step over and over and over you know that's self stimulatory play we don't want that but again don't get too freaked out if all the kid wants to do is 
put the baby doll in the water and then push and push and push and push to get uh, more water to come out of the shower and then maybe wash a little bit and then get the baby out and do it all over again. That's completely normal and that's exactly what we want to see here at stage six. Our third theme for toddlers is a house or a playground set. Now I nearly always start with a playground set because there are less pieces to manage and I can usually get a little bit more of what I want versus in a house play. And here at uh, this stage of play, remember what we said we're working on? Tons of ing verbs, uh, plurals, pronouns, and possessives. So great, great way to kind of get all these things, especially the verbs. And so when I'm looking for a toy, I just look for variety for, you know, what kinds of things. You know, here we have a, uh, a swing, we have a slide, we have you know, a way to climb up, you know, uh, we have a tunnel, we have a little up and down with the seesaw here. So naturally, you know, we're starting out with lots and lots of things to do, or especially steps that we're trying to work on here at stage six. Now, I bet like you do, I bet you combine your sets, right? And so here, you know, I'm going to use whatever characters a child is interested in. So a newer theme, you know, might be Bluey and Bingo, or you might have, you know, a kid who's really into Disney characters, and you have your little Buzz Lightyear and Mickey, or um, Woody, or even Pooh. A kid might like Sesame Street with Cookie Monster and Elmo. You might have kids who are, you know, who don't watch TV, which is fabulous. And so there you just use little generic characters. Even animals work here great with the playground set. So tons of variety here. And remember we said we're just going to uh, keep looking for uh, helping a child learn how to expand actions. And so you can take one character and do lots of different things. So you can have Bluey slide. You can have a bluey swing, you can have bluey climb, there's a little climber rope on the back, you can have uh, bluey and bingo ride uh, uh, the seesaw, and again, you can do it that way, or you can have lots of characters repeat, so you can make a line to the slide, you know, Buzz Lightyear slides, Cookie Monster slides, Pooh slides, and so again, think about kind of varying uh, uh, your sequencing or varying your actions and some kids will take one character and do several different things with it which would be several steps or a kid can take uh, have one action and have several different characters do that same action you've accomplished the same goal with sequencing but a playground set is a fabulous fabulous toy for you to use to accomplish all of those goals and again there's some more ideas on your handout so check that out now here's another idea for farm play, which again is one of those big toddler things that we talk about. And the possibilities really are endless with this uh, kind of farm set. So get yourself a barn, <laughs> get yourself some people, some characters to do some things, and get yourself some animals, and then get some other little things if you can find them. And again, you can see that I've combined all kinds of sets. This is a Melissa and Doug barn set that I just love. It's very durable. It has a carry case and anything that a child can pick up and carry across the room is naturally going to be something he's going to want to do again and again and again. And don't freak out about that. Just get up and move to where he is when he's taking the barn to a different place. But again, you can do so many things with this. And so let's talk about our play goals and then our language goals. So what did we say we were going to do for play? We said we are expanding play routines, which means what? We're going to combine actions. So you can do all kinds of things with this. You can put the animals in. You can take the animals out. You can make them climb up on the barn. And let's just talk about some of the th how you would say some of this, because I don't know that I've done a ton of this model lately uh, in shows, but let's just talk about the things that you would say and how you would get this going. And so again, you, know, you might say something like, you know, oh look, here's my cow. What can my cow do? What can he do today? Oh my goodness, here he comes. Walk, 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 walk. My cow's walking. Cow's walking. Oh, what's next? What's next? Where will he go? Oh, cow goes in. Cow's walking in. Oh, look at that cow. What's he going to do? Oh, I think he's sleepy. Shh. I think he wants to go to sleep. And I'm a little awkward doing this, but you get my point. And you're going to make him lay down and go to sleep. And so you just help lead a child through all those things. And will it be as fast as that? No. You're going to slow it way down because the child's going to be doing things that you'll talk about while you are uh, saying what you're going to say with play. And you're naturally going to talk about what he's doing, what you're doing. But my point is here, you want to make uh, sure that a child sequences several steps in a row because that's our goal here is to explain, uh, expand those play 
uh, options. And so again, a tractor or some other little uh, things for uh, other things to do that'll help make it easier to sequence steps there. So add a tractor, add, like we said before, a trough or something for putting water in. You know, that's real fun for kids to do, to have a, a little plastic animal. You know, you put real water in that little container and you're just going to hold that child's attention for much, much longer than had you not taken the time to plan something like that. All right, let's think about our language goals here. We're always going to think about what? Vocabulary development. <laughs> so a child needs a word for everything he or she would do while they are playing with this barn. So lots and lots of possibilities just for uh, semantic development here and expanding their vocabularies. Uh, let's think about utterance length. Are we going to phrases or are we going to longer phrases here? So that's certainly something we can think about with expansion and extension. And remember what we said those things were. Expansion is Whatever the child says, he says a word or two, we're going to add another word, sometimes two, to that to make his, expand his utterance and make it longer. Extension is kind of the same thing. It's where we extend what a child is saying to make it more adult-like. So if he says tractor you would and boy tractor, you would say, yes, the boy is driving the tractor. So that's an extension. It makes it longer. It gets his little childlike phrase extended to an adult-like model. So those are our big strategies there. Let's talk about our other goals that we can easily incorporate here with this kind of arm play. Uh, let's talk about receptive language. So what about following two-step commands? And so let me say, unless the child is consistently following what? One-step commands, he can't get to two-step commands. So if you're doing a ton of two-step commands, figure out what's wrong. Is it too long? Do you need to just still focus on those single step commands? Or maybe you need that in-between step that we said, like finding two different items. So maybe with him, the kind of play that you would do would be like, oh, I see some things right here. Give me the cow and the duck. You know, and he does that. Or, okay, now let's get the boy and the tractor. Okay, now find the mommy and the pumpkins. You know, that, again, is a way to really help him develop that working memory. And he's got to listen for those two parts and not leave off the first part and get the second or leave off the second and get the first. And you've got to combine those. So that's, that's a good way to kind of think about that progression. If I have a child that can't do two-step commands yet, what can he do? What's the problem here? Is it the individual vocabulary? Does he need more verbs? Do we just need to spend some time on receptive language with, with verbs? Do we need to really have him, you know, see him demonstrate the cow can walk, the cow can climb, the cow can fly, the cow can drink, the cow can eat, the cow can sleep, the cow can jump. And so again, look at what where your holes are, you know, and try to figure out and be a detective here. And therapists are great at that, but sometimes parents aren't so great. You know, they just think, oh, it's, you know, they think it's one problem and it's really something else. So that's where we come in as therapists with really presenting these possibilities. You know, is it that the command is too long? Is it that they don't understand the verbs? Is it, you know, what what is it? Figure out what that deficit is and really fill in that gap because that's where we can be. Uh, you know, again, more help to a parent than anything else is helping them really think about and, and pinpoint exactly what's wrong and then help give them really specific strategies and activities to work through that and help that child accomplish uh, those goals. All right, let's talk about our bigger goals here. We said for a child who was at that 24 to 30 month developmental level, we said ING verbs. And again, you can target this just in so many natural contexts here with your different animals doing different actions and you can model 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 which again what did we say when we talked about uh, high intensity modeling what does research tell us it says that kids need to hear a target word how many times a minute nine times a minute that is so much repetition but that's what so many of our little friends need and that's what research tells us that when they hear that word that many times they're going to retain that word and then be able to say that word so that's a big, big, uh, important strategy and important lesson for us to remember here is just how important repetition is. All right, plurals, we can work on that naturally here. More than one duck, duck becomes ducks, the pig become pigs, and so you can do some nice little things with grouping. <coughs> you can also work on that grouping goal where maybe you're even, you know, you can naturally group all the cows, all the ducks, all the pigs. You can do some things with grouping vehicles versus people or animals versus you know trucks or anything that you would do so farm play is fantastic for toddlers it's a great way to keep them motivated and again you can work on just about any goal 
Now, I love the next evolution of play here with vehicles, and that's with adding a place for all of those cars and trucks and trains and boats to go to. And so you could do something like a little garage or even like this little racetrack. Uh, and just, again, your purpose here is to help children sequence action. So make sure there's something else for them to do. Even with a set like this where the primary, you know, focus here, the purpose of the toy is helping, um, you know, the, the cars go down the racetrack. But there's a little a gas pump here. We've got a little garage so kids can put cars in there. And remember, even something like sequencing four cars in a row, you know, first it's the orange car's turn, and then it's the green car's turn, and then the blue car. Even if they're just doing that, just make sure, again, that our purpose here is expanding play. So if they're just getting a couple of actions going in a row. So these are two fantastic toys for you to use. Now, don't get lost here. What are your goals at stage six? Remember, it's what? You get more steps and more phrases. So look for those combinations. Look for those actions. Um, so again, that you're giving a child not only something to do, but to talk about uh, while he's doing it. One, One more, more classic, classic toy, toy that, that we, we haven't, haven't talked about in this whole podcast, podcast series is potato, potato heads. And that's, that's kind of a staple for speech therapy with toddlers, toddlers and preschoolers. So let's talk about potato heads. And, and again, again, it's really appropriate for this stage of play because we have lots of pieces and lots of different things to talk about. Now, you can certainly do requesting when you have just an empty potato head and you're holding all of the pieces. And so you want a child to ask you for what comes next, and that's fantastic. And we can certainly do that with uh, requests, with phrases, with, you know, hat please, or more ears, or I need arm, you know, those kinds of things. And so work on that with putting the potato head together. But then some of our little friends, this is not going to be enough to hold their attention, or for whatever reason, they're just not interested in the potato heads yet. And so again, this might be a child who play is probably not at this developmental level. It's probably going to be a kid who's before here. And we talked about this back in show four. Uh, 70 to show right before this one, but I wanted to mention it again. When we have a child who seems interested, or maybe not even interested, but we, we just can't get him to stay with the toy, and sometimes it is because that toy is too hard and he doesn't really get that whole purpose of play with that toy, and so we start with what we call deconstruction. And that just means that we're going to take the toy apart and play with it that way instead of playing it uh, the right way or assembly or putting it together. And so potato heads are a fantastic option for kids who are, you know, kind of in this stage where, again, we're teaching them how to play. And so instead of putting these pieces on, we're going to take the pieces off. And again, um, this might be too much for some children who are busy sensory seekers who just need to do two or three things or can only do two or three things before they are off to do their own thing. And you've got to kind of pull them back to finish the activity. You know, deconstruction is a great way to help those kids really learn how to focus and complete that entire task. And so here, their job is going to be to take the pieces off. And so a lot of times with these kids, too, they're not really talking yet, and so you're going to be doing the narrating. And so, again, you know, glasses off, hat off, and maybe even give the instructions where you're cueing, and they're, they're really having to learn how to listen. And so you're saying to them, shoes, let's take the shoes off next, get the shoes. And you may even be, again, cueing that with visual cues with pointing or you know, help those little auditory cues, even with tapping, that they can, they can hear it and they can see you doing it. You're kind of, you know, multimodal cueing there. And so help them with that deconstruction. And let me tell you what always happens after a kid has done deconstruction for a while. Do you know what he's going to do after that? You get all the pieces off, he's going to naturally start to want to put them back on. And when that happens, don't stop him. Don't say, no, that's the end of that. Let's No, that's what we want. And so after you've done deconstruction for a few sessions or days or weeks or however you think about it with kids, he's going to naturally start, oh, getting that next piece back out. And then you know what? <laughs> he's ready. He's ready to put it together because he's shown you that. So deconstruction is a great way to get there when kids, again, aren't getting there on their own. So a toy with a lot of pieces like this, start with taking it apart rather than pulling it together or putting it together. Um, a container is going to make this a lot easier for kids because there's a visual ending and they've got something to do. You can have kids just kind of discard the pieces on the floor, but I found just helping them 
kind of see that it's all together. And again, that definite ending for the task. It makes kids who have a hard time kind of sitting through a whole play routine with you, they can see, oh, I've just got to get all the pieces in there and then I'm done. And again, they're not doing that verbally, but you know by watching their behavior, that's uh, what they're thinking and how they're processing it. So deconstruction is a great toy for that. And I love potato heads for this age. You can do a ton of different things with that. Uh, a ton of different language goals. I've got some cute videos about potato heads that I did a while back that uh, really walk through my levels of imitation, and I'll try to link that below. So if you haven't seen those videos, take a look. You're going to get a lot of good ideas for potato heads. The last kind of play we want to talk about today would be sensory play opportunities. Now, I've said over and over that this work is an extension of Dr. Karolinski's work with symbolic play, but she identifies sensory play, particularly with sand, as one of the best or, or most popular focuses for children in this developmental period from 24 to 30 months. So let's talk about different sensory play opportunities. Now there's a formula for it, and once you learn the formula, again, you're going to be able to apply this and use it in lots of different settings with lots of different kids who have lots of different goals. And so I think about this for this formula. I think first I need a container. Now if you are playing one-on-one -on -one individually with a child, a small container like this is perfect. For groups of children, you need something bigger like a water table or a sensory table that you can switch out the different fillers, which we're going to talk about next. And I'll try to link the sensory table that uh, I used in my office for a long time. I'll link that uh, here below. But otherwise, just for moms at home with your own light talker that you're working with, these little plastic containers that you can get you know, for less than 10 bucks at Walmart uh, with a top or kind of the way to go. So the first thing you want to do is get a container. Next, you want to think about what your filler is. Now, Dr. Westby really uh, talked about sand. And so here in Florida, sand is plentiful for me. <laughs> but if you uh, are looking to get sand for your uh, play, sensory play boxes, uh, I've linked some clean sand here below, but you can also get that at Lowe's or Home Depot or anywhere like that. But sand has gotten pricey, so I use the free version here. You can also use a uh, like gift bag filler, which you can get at uh, dollar stores, and I like that a lot. You can also use rice or beans or pasta. Uh, let's talk about the obvious when we're choosing filler. We really don't want to use it with kids who are still mouthing lots of materials. And that's just from a practical standpoint. And my little rule is, if I'm spending more time managing behavior than teaching language or play, that's not the, the activity that I want to use with the child. Because then that becomes all about saying no, or all about limiting what they're naturally wanting to explore. And I just don't feel like you can get much else done <laughs> when you're focused on that. So wait until the child developmentally is not mouthing so many things. And coincidentally, that happens at 24 months where children aren't really uh, as mouthy or as oral as they were previously. So get yourself a container, decide on your filler, and then add some tools. Now, what do I mean by tools? That would be something for a kid to use to manipulate the filler. So if you have sand, certainly something like uh, my little set here with shovels and rakes and scoops are perfect. If you don't have that, go raid the kitchen and just get some spoons and some measuring cups and some scoops from uh, your supplement containers or, you know, whatever you have available there. And this is so fun for kids. And this will literally keep them busy for hours if you are a parent at home. Now, this really isn't language-wise. You know, anytime a child is independently playing, they're not really learning language, right? But they are learning play skills, and that's fantastic. But again, you want to have some opportunities uh, where you might give them different different things to do when they are independently playing with their sensory boxes versus the kinds of things you're doing when you're playing with them. And so think about that too. Now beyond your container, your filler, and your tools, most kids are also going to need something to do. Now with the sand, that can be putting it in a bucket or again your uh, measuring cup or some other, you know, a cool whip container, anything uh, that would give them something to do with that sand. The other thing that's so fun that lots of speech therapists do is really hide little objects in the material. And I tell you, a lot of times I'll just introduce the container and the filler and the tools for a week or two and then put the objects in as a surprise a week or two later and that's a way to extend a kid's attention and then it's like oh, it's become new again so it's a great way to kind of uh, 
you know, elongate that process. Now, older toddlers might expect there to be something in there from the beginning. <laughs> so you'll just have to see see what you do. But it hide objects in your filler. In this one, I have lots of sea creatures. Uh, I think I played with this last with my two-year-old grandbaby Henry, and that's what he was really into when he came to see us. So you can certainly do that, or anything, uh, any other little animal packs, and you can pick these up for cheap, like at the cash register at Walmart. So. Uh, you, you can even do, if you're working with older children on articulation and you're using, you know, something like pictures rather than uh, real toys, you can still hide these pictures in there and that's going to make that routine a lot more fun and hold that child's attention a lot better than if you had just done even a naming activity with flashcards. And this is a less, maybe less efficient way to do it, but it's a whole lot more fun and a whole lot uh, more developmentally appropriate. And you can certainly work on your older uh, goals that we've been talking about. And let's review them one more time here at the end. Remember, our big language goals were what? We want longer phrases to get to three or more words by the end of this period. We want to use a lot more action words, so a lot more verbs. So you can certainly do that with your objects once a child has found the animal. Those aren't good examples. Here's a turtle. You, know, you can make that turtle do all kinds of things, you know, and, and really uh, see if you can get that child to say 10 different verbs, you know, what it, whatever your little number is or what it, how many, you know, five new verbs that he might use during that activity. So really get creative with that. So your verbs. And then what else did we say? We said we were going to use verb tenses like with ing verbs. So we can certainly think about that. We said we were going to do plurals. And so we have to have uh, rakes and spoons and something else again to make plural so we can target that. We can do our possessives with uh, Laura's uh, lion versus Logan's lion as we're playing. We can do um, our pronouns there and really work on our pronouns. So anything, you can adapt uh, those goals with your activities. Uh, if you're just a little bit creative, and I hope that I've given you tons of ideas through this whole show to do that. All right, so we are at the end of our toy review. I'm going to show you a couple of more resources that I have for you to teach you to talk that may be really, really helpful to you as you are working with children in this developmental level. I've already mentioned the Late Talker Workbook, which has three different plans, all evidence-based for teaching a late talker, and that would be a child who's two or older, who's not using at least 50 words, or who, again, for whatever developmental level that they're at, there's a delay between what they're doing versus what the expectation is. So super, super book to get you started. It's written for both parents and professionals. There's a sit down and do therapy plan in here that works fantastic for therapists who are doing direct sessions, as well as parent training programs. If you are a therapist working with parents and you want to give them strategies and activities to use at home, great, great book to do it. This is also a fantastic book that parents are telling me is guiding them for their home programs. So I'm so excited to share it with you. So that's the Late Talker Workbook. If you're working with a child with autism, <coughs> please, please check, check out, out the Autism, autism Workbook. There are 12 different focuses or goals or big areas of development that we look at with a child's language. A child who's already been diagnosed with autism or a child who has markers for autism. Uh, let's talk about talking is a fabulous goal uh, or a fabulous resource for working toward your goal of getting a, a child to be verbal. And so here we're looking at the pre-linguistic skills that all children master uh, before they begin to use words. And so this is a fantastic uh, book for parents and therapists, particularly when you have a child who's just really stumping you, that you're not understanding really what's going on, that you're not sure why they're making a, not making a lot of progress. So the checklist and the questions, and let's talk about talking, will walk you through that process. And finally, teach me to play with you. And there's some information in here about playing with the kinds of toys that we've talked about through this series, especially the earlier toys that are familiar to all kids. Blocks, balloons, uh, bubbles, those kinds of early toys. But also, this book just focuses on that social engagement piece. So teaching a child how to perform little games and routines and finger plays and songs with you, learn how to do those motions, and then finally start to talk in the context of those games. So I hope that you'll check these resources out, and they are all linked right here below in the post on YouTube. All right, that's it for today. Thank you so much for hanging in here with me through this entire long course. I so appreciate it. If you're a therapist, don't forget to go get your CE credit at teachmetotalk.com. And uh, this show is number 471. That's it for today. I'll see you next time for show 472. Thanks so much.